Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is Akshaya Kamalat, a senior lecturer at Australian National University College of Law. We'll be discussing her recent article, Social Movements, Diversity, and Corporate Short-Termism, which is forthcoming in the Georgetown Journal of Gender and the Law. Akshaya, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. If I'm the CEO of a public company, I'm going to encounter perhaps shareholder activism, but I might also encounter activism from the public. What sort of public activism might I encounter as the CEO of a public company? And has the nature of that activism, the face of that activism, have they changed in recent years? As a CEO of a public company or a company director, there's bound to be shareholder activism, but public activism, what I call social activism in the paper, has always existed. Usually it's been for a cause or it's for when there's some sort of big event that shocks the conscience. So, for example, an environmental disaster, there is awareness of it. And then sometimes there could be protests on the ground. There's some media coverage. All of that has now changed. And you can think about it as turbocharged by social media because it's become very easy to coordinate this activism across not just people who are related to the company, but anyone who's reading these tweets or posts on social media. And in a way, it's become really easy to coordinate. And for someone who knows nothing about an event to read something on social media and then join in on the bandwagon. I'd say it has changed a lot. So there's one thing is that there's social media. The other thing is the younger generations, I wouldn't just use millennials and Gen Z years because perhaps not all millennials are digital natives, but more or less the younger generation is very comfortable self-expressing themselves on social media. You, as a customer, if you have a bad experience that gets posted on social media. That could then escalate with others reading about it and posting about how they had similar experiences. So even smaller issues sometimes can become much bigger because of social media now. It doesn't have to be a big event like in the past. And it can escalate very quickly and companies are left to react under pressure. So I think that's really something that's changed recently. In your paper, you focus on Over the last five years or so, the rise of the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement as challenging what corporations are doing to promote equity within their ranks, not just at the board level, the CEO level, but within the rank and file of their workforces. What have been some of the demands of activists on the Me Too, on the Black Lives Matter fronts, and how have they communicated their demands to firms? I've been talking about social movements and social activism generally, and I focus on diversity particularly. So that's why I picked up on the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements. We already had before these movements some amount of push both from the law in some countries and through institutional investors to diversify the board of directors. That has changed. We've started to go beyond that with these movements. With the Me Too movement, whenever there's been an incident reported, usually the person responsible for the incident, there are calls to fire the person. So if it's a high ranking executive, then it becomes even more of a companies are put under pressure to fire that executive. Then it also goes further. The moment there's some sort of incident from a company, then we see posts on social media about how that company's leadership is not diverse. So there is that emphasis on diversity in the leadership. But as the Black Lives Matter movement started, companies started to join the movement to almost leverage the movement and put out statements in support of Black Lives Matter to use it, to leverage it in their advertisements to ensure that they're not at the receiving end of the movement. So social media reacted with essentially asking companies to put their money where their mouth is, right? Saying, I think there was open your purse as a response to companies that made some statements in support of Black Lives Matter. And some companies then responded by actually going ahead and donating to certain related causes. There were 
were also some employees who responded maybe anonymous it, it got picked up on social media that the very same companies that are putting up these statements aren't really treating employees diverse employees within the company very well so that put a focus on diversity in the workforce not just on the company leadership then we had companies actually coming out and committing to diversify the workforce there were numerical targets put out about we will have this percent of black and latino and latina members by a certain year and so there were these very tangible commitments coming up you also had sometimes reactions on social media weren't exactly accurate sometimes you would have reactions saying companies saying certain things in support of black lives matter or diversity but does not have any diversity on its board but as it turns out that wasn't true so social movements were good at calling out hypocrisy of companies but at times these were not very accurate like i said the social media activism can escalate very fast not everyone is fact checking what they're supporting that also happened but overall i think companies because of these movements were forced to focus on diversity beyond just their upper levels the board and management levels in your paper you discuss efficacy of practices around making a difference for gender and racial diversity and equity in the workplace. What practices do you evaluate in the paper? Do you have any recommendations to offer? Initially, I start by drawing on the Eric Holder Committee report, which was basically the result of an investigation that Uber commissioned after sexual harassment issues were reported by one of its employees through a blog post, and then that went viral on social media. So in that case, that was one instance where the company reacted by commissioning an internal investigation and made the report of that committee available publicly. I draw a little from there. I don't take all of those recommendations but some of them i think we can draw on and extrapolate for the black lives matter movement as well and generally to ensure there is better diversity or companies are combating issues with diversity better so all of my recommendations broadly go towards calling for more long term change in terms of working towards changing the company culture itself and addressing implicit bias which i don't think simply appointing diverse board members would change so i do this by first of all saying that you need to have mechanisms in place to ensure that you're able to suss out uh, figure out problems in the company before it's reported outside and it becomes a social media crisis that you need to respond to under pressure and to do this one thing i take from that holder committee report is complaint mechanisms so every company possibly has ways to report issues but one of the things that holder committee recommends is having alternative multiple channels to report issues and also in training human resources in terms of letting human resources personnel knowing which issues to escalate to the board and so this becomes a kind of board responsibility to act on these issues when they hear about it they talk about figuring out patterns so if you have repeated complaints about a certain executive then there's a real problem there and then to act on that i also look beyond the report in technological solutions in the market have come up in terms of one app letting employees check if there have been other employees that have reported issues against the same person and then based on that they can decide whether to report so there are these sort of innovations that companies can figure out and decide what uh, works best within the company but i think having different ways in which the board can figure out issues before the fact and another way even complaint mechanisms and reporting mechanisms is one way another way is for the board and management to proactively survey employees and get a sense of the culture and where the problems lie so a lot of it is in terms of ensure bring this information flows to the board and the board acts on it currently companies have been responding to these issues sometimes by appointing a chief diversity officer or having a diversity committee and my pushback or argument there is that this isn't working in many cases because the board and ceo probably don't empower these committees and the diversity officers enough so ultimately the corporate leaders must 
commit to addressing these issues. Otherwise, having all of these complaint mechanisms, etc., isn't really going to help. That's one part of it. The second thing that is getting rid of implicit bias, it has to happen at the level of hiring. It has to happen at the level of ensuring that diverse members have the same opportunity to be promoted within the company. Some firms have started to say that words in the language of job advertisements, probably that there's research to show that women would not apply to certain firms based on language in the advertisements. And some companies are trying to change this. So that's one innovative mechanism at the hiring level. But Firms have to figure out what works best for them to be able to attract diverse talent and make sure to hire diverse members at that level itself. But it's not enough to hire these people to meet those numerical targets that companies have committed to and say that, look, we've met these targets. Because if the culture doesn't support all types of people within the company, they're probably likely to leave very soon. So they also need to make sure that there is enough opportunities to progress within the firms. There have been suggestions again on this in terms of having ensuring that promotion committees themselves are diverse to make sure that the promotions are fair, the processes are fair. So again, it would be, I'm a huge fan of firm specific solutions. So firms have to see what works best within their company, figure out the data of what's going wrong, like I said, through surveys, but also exit interviews, if there's a lot of attrition of one type of employees, why is this? So those sort of things will help them ensure that they get rid of implicit bias at these bottlenecks that is hiring and promotion. I also talk about thinking about flexible working options now that we've all become comfortable with this in the wake of the pandemic. Companies should think about allowing some of this even in normal times where employees require it. And I think these sort of programs will not only help, usually you would think that women would require flexible work more than men, but I think if company leadership also starts to use these flexible work options, including men, that shows that you're not any less of an employee by taking on these options. So setting that kind of expectation from the top and ensuring that even those that are working remotely or choose to have these hybrid options have the same kind of opportunities for promotion. So making sure that supporting diverse members and people who take the benefit of these programs are supported and don't really suffer for choosing to use these programs. The same for my previous point, making sure that people who use these complaint mechanisms aren't suffering consequences like retaliation and not being promoted, etc. And finally, I think this is something important and not spoken about as much. The emphasis through these social movements on identity groups might have made it harder for people to interact across identity groups. And there's anecdotal stories about how people really benefit when they have mentors from the dominant group, because the mentor not only helps them in terms of learning and networking, but it also makes sure that the others see that if this person is championing this person, even though they are a woman or a black person or from some other ethnic minority group, they must be talented. So it helps open doors, having mentors across identity groups. And this is becoming difficult in the wake of these movements. So there's been one suggestion about having senior women mentor junior men, because this is probably not as problematic anymore and eventually making it easier to interact across identity groups. So again, I think firms have to see what works best within their company and try to ensure that there are these networks. I also talk about office politics in general that can hold people back in terms of promotion. So when we talk about diversity, we're usually talking about women or someone who is from an ethnic minority or who's not from the dominant group being able to access things. But sometimes it can so happen that even a white male employee does not belong to the in-group for some reason and cannot access promotions. So I think all the recommendations I make for diversifying the workforce will help generally the workforce across the board and not just diverse people. One of the most intriguing points that this paper makes, and you mentioned at the top of the last question, the role of of long-termism in promoting diversity and equity in the workplace. But one of the most intriguing points that you make is that there's a danger of short-termism when 
companies are trying to make improvements in these areas. And we're all well versed in the dangers of short termism and other aspects of corporate decision making, making decisions for the next quarter as opposed to the next five or 10 years. Can you talk a little bit about what short termism might look like when it comes to diversity and inclusion and equity? and what that looks like on the ground. Yeah, so this struck me as I was looking at responses for anything that blows up in social media. Usually the company comes out and either fires the employee that everyone is saying should be fired or quickly makes a statement. In some cases, it works that the media storm dies out. In some cases, it might, there may be a response saying statement from the company, but the company isn't really doing what it says it's doing. And so it, it doesn't always work. But one thing that always comes through is that companies tend to react in a sort of immediate, without thinking too much, there's a quick fire reaction. And I think this has the same kind of dangers as when we talk about short-termism generally, specifically for equity issues. If we look at companies committing to, like I mentioned earlier on, that some companies said we would have 30% women or 30% some ethnic groups at these levels by a certain year. And Either they may not live up to that commitment, or if they do, they may just work to meet that number. There's a narrow focus on the number rather than creating a culture in the firm that can retain these diverse people. That's one of the things that's apparent in companies' immediate responses. And we don't really see any kind of updates on what companies are doing beyond those numerical commitments. And when a company fires an employee because of a social media storm. What I saw in many cases was the company probably knew about the underlying issues and did nothing. But when there was a social media storm, they decided they had to do something and went ahead and fired that employee. There hasn't been serious thought to these actions, which makes me think that when the social uh, movement, whether it's Me to a Black Lives Matter, dies down as it's bound to lose steam in at least certain periods of time, then companies would also stop paying attention to these issues and move on. And I think this is counterproductive and not helpful to the company itself, because once issues have started to be raised, employees are very much aware that these issues can have significance if they report it outside of the company. So sometimes employees may not want to report with their name, but the information has ways of flowing out. There could be surveys through Glassdoor, there could be anonymous posts that come out and companies would face consequences one way or the other because the information flows out. So I think it's counterproductive, but companies have been caught in this moment where they don't really know how to react to this social media storm. So in the paper, I actually point out that sometimes not all social media negative attention on issues can be really as serious as it looks on social media, because in many cases, people would self-censor and not speak against a certain issue that's being posted. And there's also the issue of group polarization, where people who agree with each other tend to drive the entire group's consensus into an extreme, and it can get into a resounding, you need to fire this person or boycott the company, and the storm will eventually die out. And the company in question would have reacted quickly to that social media storm, but not really address the problem. So I think this is something that we need to start focusing on, not just within the company, but even the general discourse that we have about diversity. When we talk about diversity regulations, etc., we're usually talking about appointing diverse members to the board, etc. We don't talk too much about companies addressing cultural issues. And I think the social media attention is quite useful. There's a positive side because it tends to call out hypocrisy when companies make statements and then there's information coming through that this isn't being addressed, but we need companies to focus on addressing them with a long term. What key takeaways would you like listeners to have from this interview or from the paper? And are there open questions that you might hope to answer in the future? One of the things that I have mentioned through this paper, but it's not the main focus in the paper, is that I would like firms to look at what their internal problems are through various mechanisms and then figure out solutions for themselves, so firm-specific solutions. And I think this is something that we should think about more and even in terms of 
regulation? How do we draw out or incentivize companies to come up with social innovation? So companies have been innovative in various other ways. We have innovative products, companies competing with each other to come up with the better, more innovative products. So I think that could be harnessed to have social innovations, specifically in the diversity space. Already there's, I mentioned a few innovative solutions, and I think really incentivizing companies to think of solutions that can work in the long term would be good. This would help them retain talent, whether diverse talent or otherwise. Like I said, these sort of cultural changes can help the entire workforce. So I think focus on those sort of innovative solutions to addressing culture rather than on numerical targets is something that I want more focus on and something that I'm working on beyond this paper as well. Our guest today has been Akshay Kamala, Senior Lecturer at Australian National University College of Law. We've discussed her recent article, Social Movements, Diversity, and Corporate Short-Termism, which is forthcoming in the Georgetown Journal of Gender and the Law. I'll have a link to the article in the show notes for the episode. Akshay, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. Andrew Jennings.